Awesome. Well, um, welcome to the Planetary Regeneration Podcast. I'm here with uh, one of, of a friend and inspiring peer and colleague, and in many ways, a mentor to many of us in the regenerative movement, John Fullerton. And I'm super grateful to have you, John. It's I'm excited to to dig in. Hey. Yeah, great, great, great to be with you. It's been, uh, been too long since we've had a real conversation, so looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah, me too. And recently, I had the enormous pleasure of getting to teach a little section in your uh, in your course on regenerative economics and regenerative capitalism. And um, yeah, I just have to say it was definitely a a bright spot in um, over the last couple of months of just getting to engage with an amazing community that you've pulled together and share a little bit about what we've been doing at Regen Network. And um, kudos for being a community builder. You know, I, I remember early on the Capital Institute um, working kind of on the social networking side of things and thinking, how do we convene people in, in a community of yeah. learning? And um, since then, I think you've really pulled together a fantastic community that's exploring these ideas and building capacity and capability. So it was lovely to get to dip into that and share. Yeah, it was, it was, it was wonderful having you there. And, and as, as you know, I, I know my limitations and uh, d delving into topics like crypto and blockchain is is uh, is beyond my pay grade. So it was it was great to have you with us and obviously a tremendous amount of interest in our community in in that subject. So um, uh, but yeah, it, it's been honestly, it's been hugely fulfilling personally to see this community evolve and, and emerge and the hunger, you know, we we. Um, What's clearly happening is like this this global awakening and, and and people people laugh at me. They say, you know, I thought this was a course on economics, but this is actually a a, a collective awakening. And um, uh, so it, it's been it's been wonderful, you know. And now it's you know how do we how do we take it from thousands to hundreds of thousands and and uh, and make and keep it real? So yeah, no, definitely. Well, that feels to me like it's kind of the crux we, we've uh the last few times we've we've talked including this morning we were already starting to hone in on this theme of you know as regeneration regen regenerative um starts to take hold in the consciousness of leaders and um citizens individuals business owners um consumers um we're, we're at this sort of inflection moment where it's a, it's a it's a term that's increasingly being adopted mm -hmm. more and more broadly even at institutional levels <clears throat> and with that comes great excitement i think and also mm -hmm. sort of anxiety as well yeah. uh you, you know i guess in what ways are are we risking banalizing something and degrading it and yeah. bringing things down to a lowest common denominator that actually threatens the potential that we've all been attracted to in this reframing right. and this new paradigm in this approach and to what ways do we need in, in what ways do we need to get out of our own way and mm -hmm. you know ensure that this isn't sort of an elitist right. purist test where right. you know the purity of your ideology or something excludes everyone else and so i'm just curious you know how are you experiencing that dichotomy in mm -hmm. in your work right now yeah, you know, it's a it's a great question. We we think about it and talk about it a lot. Um, I I guess well for sure it, it is a you know a rising um, phenomenon and and the evidence is you know just recently I was at the Sustainable Brands Conference, which is the big Fortune five hundred type companies, typically the the uh, chief sustainability officers, and the theme of their conference this year was regenerate local so here you have global companies coming together to talk about what regenerate local means and um and and equally in chile this year the world business council for sustainable development's theme was regeneration um and i would say what's encouraging is that there was a tremendous uh genuine interest and integrity in in it as opposed to just sort of a marketing slogan but there was also people using the word with really no idea of what it, the difference between regeneration and say sustainability is. And so I, I guess, I guess I'm just comfortable. I've just accepted that we're going to be in this 
in this paradox where it's both exciting and 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 challenging at the same time. And I'm I'm less worried about preserving the purity, I suppose, than some others um, might be. Which isn't to say that I'm you know I'm casual about it, um, but I think the way to preserve the purity is to remain above the the, the fray and the and the and the squabbling. And um, and and you know if if our course is in any you know example that the course is an attractor for people that are genuinely looking to go deep into it. And um, and I think as long as we have those kinds of attractors around of authentic, genuine exploration of this. Um, the, 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 the forces demanding regenerative thinking will keep it from going off the rails. And I think maybe when sustainability arose, it, it, it didn't have the external forces, uh, hungry for it the way, uh, the way there is today. And so, um, you know, maybe, maybe I'm being idealistic, but I think, I think people understand we're really up against it now, whereas, the sustainability movement was kind of a, a nice to have, you know, um, uh, you know, sort of a, I don't know what the right word is, but it, it wasn't sort of the sense of urgency of the meta crisis, the poly crisis that we have today. So I don't know. I, I'm just not, I'm not going to allow it to preoccupy me the way it, it seems to uh, with some folks. Yeah, no, fair enough. I think that that makes sense. And, as you, um, I guess, in this moment of the meta crisis, um, I also, I mean, I think just to maybe timestamp and contextualize this conversation, because, you know, oftentimes people will probably be tuning into this podcast, you know, potentially even years later. So just, you know, this is where we're in, um, it's October 24th, um, 2023 there was recent uh you know recent terrorist attack um in israel and then massive retaliation in gaza and um you know people are it feels like we're at a moment where sort of the real politic the geopolitics the you know the the rising temperature and tension around the world in some ways may end up threatening these you know, movements towards a regenerative mm -hmm. economy, um, these movements towards a different way of doing things, because mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, we all get so focused and we get into survival mode, I guess, mm -hmm. um, in these moments. And, you know, add on to that, um, steady and raise, you know, interest rates that don't look like they're going to be coming down at a macroeconomic level anytime too mm -hmm. soon. Right. Mm. Which um, actually, I'd love to get your take on that. You know, mm. uh, just what's the right what are the right macroeconomics? So I so I guess, you know, my that's a lot of context setting. My question would be, what is the right way for us to be approaching, you know, those of us who are kind of into bioregional, local regeneration, resilience building, the real economy, um, the health of living systems, the health of living capital and social capital and cultural capital, these forms of value that are so hard for our current economy to see. Mm -hmm. um, what are the what what are the ways to continue cultivating and growing that in the face of what appears, at least at first glance, to be trends that may flatten that out and put people mm -hmm. back into, you know, kind of a status quo mindset or, or worse. Hunker or down. worse, yeah. yeah, or worse. Well, boy, that's a that's a that's a that's a hard question that I don't have a I don't have any crystal ball. But I, I guess the way I the way I think about it, and you know, I I if 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 one were to sort of trace back to the beginning of my awakening around this, you know, it it had something to do with just sort of a quiet inner voice that had me walk away from Wall Street. But then the first thing that really happened to me in this interim period is I experienced 9-11 up close and personal. And honestly, the 21st century for me has just been a series of cascading chaos. And I think, um, 
you know, I think I'm old enough now that I have a perspective on that, that many people working in the space don't have because their entire adult life has been, that's been normal, but this isn't normal. And, um, and I think, I think we just have to get used to the fact that there's going to be continuing cascading tidal waves crashing around us and that that is the nature of the transformation that we're in. So it's the new and, normal. Kind yeah, of. the new normal. Yeah. Like that's the normal for probably the rest of our lifetimes. Uh, I don't see any. I, I think it'd be it'd be wishful thinking to think that this is about to clear. The storm is is still building, certainly the ecological storms. And the and the economic storms, um, I think probably the worst is 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 ahead because there's a direct feedback loop from the ecological storms to the economic storms. And most of those have been, in a sense, pushed out, uh, pushed out into the future. Um, but you know, that I I talk about a concept of financial overshoot, which is the corollary of ecological overshoot. And you know, financial assets are valued based on the continuation of exponential growth. And I don't think that's changed yet. And and when the financial markets begin to discount entire industries that are not going to grow, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a whole different uh, picture. So I, I think we have to get used to the chaos and, um, uh, and, and somehow keep our heads down and know that the chaos actually is, probably the only thing working in our favor to force the transformation we we all seek. Um, you know, Sally Gorner was one of my teachers, and she said once that, you know, systems only change in response to pressure. And so the, the bad news is there's chaos. The good news is the pressure's rising. And, and that will force systems to change, which doesn't mean they won't change, that they'll change in a good way. Um, but it does mean that the opportunity is coming for for bigger change than we probably uh, think is possible, and so it's a it's 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 difficult for sure. And it doesn't mean that every project and every effort we're all taking won't get swept out in the in the storm. But I do hold out real hope that you know we're we're in it and we're going through it, and um, and and this chaos is just evidence that we're you know, we're not going back to the way it was. Um, yeah. But it, it's, you know, all the more reason we align with how living systems work um, and and manifest the potential that exists all around us um, while we're doing this. Yeah. Well, so let's, um, let's talk a little bit more about that. I mean, you know, as you were talking, I was kind of getting glimpses, I think, of, kind of the the you know so i'd love to i'd love to explore more deeply these threads of you know the world that's calling you to serve its becoming you know the way that our economics may work the way that business may look um or needs to i mean i guess i would say this and i think this is a place mm -hmm. where we have a lot of sort of shared ground is that, you know, we can kind of think about from first principles coming from living systems, we can think about society and economics and evolve our system and attune it, right, to how life works and mm -hmm. how living systems work. And so I'm curious, you know, sort of with that as a framing, um, and, you know, I don't want this to be too too broad but i also don't want to make this this question too narrow so i'm i'm curious mm -hmm. you know if 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 i was able to just place you maybe i'll i'll frame the question this way if i was to if i was able to to place you next to the c suite at, like in a boardroom of you know one of you know a fortune 5 company say mm -hmm. and and say they and and say the board and the executives are bought in to the idea that they need to radically transform their operations over the course of five or ten years, uh, twenty five years maybe even. Um, 
and, so, and they're like, okay, John, you, you're here with us. You're embedded with us. What do we do? What do we do as, um, as a major corporation that, mm. that has all this legacy um, momentum, inertia? Mm. Um, mm. What are the trim tabs, you know, to be turning mm. that ship? Um, is it purely, you know, you know, and I'm curious, would you approach that sort of Socratically? Would you be saying, okay, here's some frameworks and I'm going to be asking you questions and you're going to be thinking about things? Would you be approaching that sort of more in like a McKinsey consultancy sort of way where you sort of like mm. say, okay, like I've got a deck for you. <laughs> here's, the, <laughs> here's the thing. Got a really here. fancy deck for you. Yeah, I've got a really fancy deck for you. Like here, I've got, yeah. the, I've got the answers that you need. You know, how... Yeah, first off, just the meta question, how would you be approaching that? Um, yeah. And and second, well, off, give me a sense of like what you think the changes, what your intuition are is yeah. around the changes that might be called for. Yeah. Um, interesting question. Because um, I haven't been called into that C-suite uh, of a Fortune 5 company. Um, Not yet, but maybe they're listening. Yeah, maybe they're listening. I mean, the first thing I'd tell you what I wouldn't do is is do what McKinsey does because what McKinsey does is tell companies what they want to hear and charge them a lot of money. So um, that probably yeah. wouldn't work. But yeah, um, that's a mess. Yeah. You know, I, honestly, the first thing I would do is invite invite them. This is going to sound trite and self serving, but the first thing I would do is invite them to take my eight week course. Um. And 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 I would invite them to do that because it would be sort of a fast track to the the new way of seeing that will be the kind of the the necessary foundation for wrestling with the real question that they have. Because um, I th I think as as you know, in fact, just for your listeners, I have to sh quickly share a, a funny little story when. When I first gave, I think it was probably the first time I presented my regenerative economics framework in a in a public forum in Colorado. This guy named Gregory came up to me afterward with a little book called Regenerative Enterprise. And he said, Hey, that was a nice talk. Have you seen my book? <laughs> so <laughs> Gregory had already written the book, but um uh but at any rate, I um uh you know, I I think we underestimate how radical this new way of seeing is for for people who have not had a chance to wrestle with it for literally years. And if I've made one contribution to the to the transformation we're all working on, it's it's the 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 years and in fact more than a decade now that I've been wrestling with this myself through the lens of a mainstream you know, in my case, finance guy, but mainstream business, um, uh, the, the the unlearning and then relearning required to be able to see this is is profound. And to get into solutions and, you know, strategies before you have that, that new way of seeing is probably a waste of everyone's time. And so um, I would either create a little mini course for them or invite them into the the bigger course. And the, and the advantage of the latter is that they, they get to meet all the cool people in the community and they realize it's not just, you know, some guy's idea. It's like, there's this vibrant energy arising around this. So that's the first thing I would do. And then, um, you know, if, if they gave me more time, I would, um, you know, I would probably want to work with, you know, two layers of management below them um, as, a, as a way to get started, because this isn't going to be something that gets imposed top down. It's going to be something that, you know, one of the principles we talk about is empowered participation, and they're going to need the participation of of certainly the, the leaders in their company, and there are leaders in their company they don't even realize are leaders in their company. So it would be a, you know, ideally there'd be at least a one-year awakening phase before you even tried to get to, okay, well, what are we going to do? Um, and, and in my course, I, 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 I tell people, I'm not going to allow you to get into action until you get really uncomfortable and, and wrestle with this 
because it's 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 profoundly different. I you know I use the analogy. I don't know if if you agree with this, but I think this transformation is bigger than the shift from the medieval age to the modern age. The consequences are certainly bigger, but the the worldview is is at least equally profoundly different as as that one was. So the trouble is we're in chaos mode and we're in crisis mode and everyone wants to act, act, act and do, do, do and solve problems, solve problems. And we, you know, again, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but we end up creating bigger messes or or not addressing the, the root causes. And, you know, just as one example, the whole ESG movement, um, uh, environmental social governments that governance that corporations have embraced for 20 years now um, is a is a, you know, there, there was there was um, assumptions built into that strategy that if we that markets are the solution, government's not the solution. So we need efficient markets. So if we have more transparent data, markets will be more efficient and we'll solve these problems. Well, I think that's just incredibly naive <laughs> thinking. Uh, markets are, are are not God, they're a tool. And, and sure, transparent markets, more information is always better. But to think that that was going to trigger a transformation of our economic system uh, on the scale that's required was was just ignorant you know, ignorant thinking. And, and um, you know, we're now seeing a, a wonderful correlation between the rise of ESG investment funds and the rise of CO2 emissions. Um, <laughs> they, they, they're kind of going in lockstep. So, but getting back to your question, I, I, I'll have a, I have a couple of thoughts just to give you an idea on where it would go once we got to the, um, you know, the kind of search for, for, for real change. Um, you know, the first thing I would say is the company needs to have a good, hard look at itself and and decide and declare what the truth is about its business. And very few big businesses do that. But interestingly, I'll tell you one that has, and it's it's almost public enemy, enemy number one, which is Philip Morris International. And six years ago, they they declared publicly, we kill people, essentially. And here's what we're going to do about it. And they're on this path to transform their business from a smoking company to a smokeless company. And I don't want to get into the debate about whether that's good or whether that's not good enough and whatnot. But but it, it is true that smoking cigarettes kills you because of this of the burning part, not the nicotine part. And so if if you can convert people, if you can pe convert people that are nic addicted to nicotine to smokeless versions of nicotine, you're likely to save their life. Um, and but what's important is that they said the truth. Now they said the truth after decades of lying. So, but but why can't Exxon say the truth, and why can't um, Facebook say the truth as the beginning of a uh, of a pathway to to real transformation? Um, and then the other idea I would I would just throw out is that these big corporations are essentially the self-organized ecosystems they're 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 coral reefs they're rainforests and guys like you and i run around working on startups it's kind of like planting a tree in the desert and watering it against all odds of success when in fact living systems the diversity builds out of existing ecosystems where one ecosystem meets another one and so i think big corporations have a huge opportunity and role to play in facilitating this, you know, emerging innovation uh, uh, that, you know, we, we need many, many more enterprises that are new and different than the existing ones. And, and the existing corporations have a, you know, they have something to defend, but they also, I mean, several of them, I can't think, I just heard recently, they, they created a startup outside their company, which was designed to compete against them and destroy their products because they'd rather own it than have someone else own it. So if they're serious about transformation, then um, where better to build the future enterprises than leveraging off the many, many relationships they have, the cash flows that flow through them and whatnot. So um, that would be a, you know, a core area of focus, um, which is very different than greening the supply chain. You know, the incremental stuff is always important, but it's not transformational. 
So there's just a couple ideas I throw out. Yeah, no. Um, and I love that. I, I love that provocation around the, the power of these large corporates to kind of create innovation space <clears throat> and, and really not just their power to, but, but how that is demanded. Right. Um, I guess I, 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 I wonder sometimes the degree to which th these big um, institutions are resilient or anti-fragile to disturbance, you know, to, to what, at what point of disturbance and shaking as, yeah. as the earth goes through changes and our society goes through changes, do these systems kind of collapse and then something else is born. And there's, I mean, here there's all of this science around sort of ecology, disturbance, ecological succession, and under mm. what conditions does something new grow versus mm. does the same system regrow? I, yeah. I think is a really interesting question. And, um, you know, I think in, in defense of the, um, like in total agreement and in defense of the, the idea that maybe there needs to be innovation around the edges that that is kind of in, independent or kind of following that Bucky Fuller idea yeah. of, yeah, yeah. you know, make a better party, build something yeah. totally different that, yeah. that sort of out competes or makes obsolete the existing system. I mostly think of that within the framework of how are we creating a seedbed or a set of you know, sort of like a, a diversity of new organisms that when disturbance takes place is is ready to sort of spring forth and actually fundamentally change the systemic dynamics. Yeah. Um, but is I think it, that has to that happen in, 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 in relationship. It, I mean, that can't, you can never really be an isolation or an island. It, I right. think there's a huge role for sort of the entrepreneurs in these big corporates to be creating space for that type of pretty radical innovation um, that then can grow grow as disturbance takes place, which yeah. we know will happen. We, we may not know exactly what it'll be or when it will happen, but yeah, as yeah. you were mentioning earlier, you know, I think the idea here is that we're entering into an era of an increasing magnitude and frequency of disturbances, you know, right. and we call this the poly crisis or the meta crisis, but we know that that's, right. that seems to be what's happening. So as those disturbances happen, again, what are the conditions kind of on the ground that allow a new system to spring up and grow and, you know, and ideally be regenerative and have that mm -hmm. take our operating capacity as a society up an order of magnitude instead of shifting it down an order of magnitude. Right. And I, I would, you know, hasten to add, I, I don't view this as a, as a either or, right. It's a, it's a both end. And, you know, what, what I'm suggesting about big corporations and I, and by the way, I don't spend my time working with big corporations just to, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. People probably think I do because I come out of one, but I'm, I'm, you know, I, 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 I had to be dragged to sustainable brands last year because I, I, I said to Coen, I'm not sure that that audience is ready for what I have to say. And and she convinced me because um, she said, don't confuse the companies with the, the people in the companies that are hungry, that are trying to turn the battleship and whatnot. But so, you know, having said that, I, I tend to work more on the on the outside edge than trying to be working inside big companies. But um, but, you know, you ask what should big companies do and, and they have this huge opportunity to see themselves as this ecosystem home, you know, um, um, you know, um, uh, host. And uh, and many of them don't do that. In fact, if they have any entrepreneurial entrepreneurial activities and, you know, investing in startups, it's with an eye toward acquiring and them and building a, a bigger, a bigger moat around themselves as opposed to building a healthier system that they're a part of. And I, I just think it's a sort of a, it's low hanging fruit for them to to view themselves as the oak tree in the forest and how they can facilitate life as opposed to just how can I become a bigger oak tree and, and compete um, and whatnot. So, um, but definitely, definitely a, a, you know, a, a both end approach, um, uh, you know, as, as you were describing. Yeah, no, love it. So maybe it's useful at, at this stage to just kind of 
I, I want to go back to you, you know, in your, in your answers and in, in the way that you're talking about everything, I can see kind of like the principle based thinking that you're, you know, you even mentioned, um, you know, empower participation. Um, I not exactly sure the two yeah. words there, but yeah, 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 yeah. As, as one of the core principles, but maybe sort of cycling back and saying, you know, why is principle based thinking important? And, and what are those core principles that you've um, sort of uncovered and, and surfaced um, that you're basing the kind of educational process, community process, and dialogue process that the Capital Institute is facilitating. Um, and yeah. maybe the, the third layer of this question is, how did you uncover those principles? You know, what was the process mm. where of your discovery to kind of, um, you know, yeah, what, yeah, did they emerge? Did you dig them up? Did you, mm. you know, um, do the I Ching? You know, what was the process of, <laughs> of you know, finding or discovering these yeah. principles that you're rooting everything into? Well, I think the first thing to say is that I, I, I think we have to accept that we're lost. Um, we, we are trying to solve problems and we're kind of increasingly in a chaotic way, scrambling around to fix problems. And more often than not, the, the problems we're trying to fix are really symptoms of, a, of an underlying root cause that we don't fully understand. And so if we start with a place of humility and, and say we're lost, um, you're, you naturally, the first thing you do when you're lost is you, you need a compass. And um, and so for me, the 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 primacy of first principles, as opposed to goals or you know deliverables or you know we we love our goals, right? Let's set a SDGs. Let's set some goals. Cop, you know, Paris Agreement. Let's set goals, and 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 we have this idea that if we set a goal and then measure what matters and and uh, manage what we measure, uh, somehow we'll get to our goal, and. And um, and that that works really well when you're building a, a machine um, and have resources to pour into it. But it 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 fails miserably when we're trying to work with complexity. And um, so the you know, the the first premise of regenerative economics is that the economy is a living system. And uh, and we could have a long debate about whether that's true or not. But chances are most of the people on this podcast probably find that self-evident a self-evident truth humans are living systems gaia is a living system and the economy is embedded in gaia and made up of humans um and their tools and so how could it not be uh also a living system even if it's an unhealthy living system and so then you get to the thought well if it's if it needs to behave the way living systems do and, and living systems have one really cool attribute which is that they're still living they're not dead um, so if we want a sustainable economy, it seems self-evident to me that you go to study how living systems work and what their design principles are and learn to align with them as opposed to thinking we're going to solve problems with our human brilliance. And um, and so there, there's no, um, I, you know, I'm always quick to say there's no right first principles. The, 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 there is a law of gravity and, and, um, and we need to behave in accordance with the law of gravity, particularly for designing airplanes. Uh, and in a similar way, there is patterns and principles of how living systems tend to behave. They, they tend to be, you know, what, what the ecologists describe is, is they, there are tendencies toward things, right? There's not absolute um, laws. So, you know, women tend to be smaller than men, which doesn't mean that every woman is smaller than every man. Um, uh, and, 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 and there tends to be patterns, fractal patterns in living systems. And so, you know, what, what I did is I, you know, I, I went to school, I not, not, you know, I, I studied a lot, uh, from many of the, what I think are the, the best living and non-living living systems thinkers around and, and, um, and just sort of drew out of that. Um, what I thought were the core first principles that worked in the context of a global economy. And, and honestly, where I started was with Janine Benyus's principles, 
uh, biomimicry principles. But it was interesting as I worked with them, many of them are highly overlapping with what I described. But for example, but some of them are unique to the context Janine tends to focus on, which is the, the product and, and, and materials space. So pretty far downstream. And so for example, green chemistry is one of her first principles. And of course, green chemistry is, is a brilliant first principle. Um, but if you're elevating to the macro economy, green chemistry falls into, for me, you know, healthy inputs in a metabolism. Um, but there are other first principles that become more important, like holistic wealth is, is what I talk about. So th this is a, this is an art, not a science. Um, but, but I, I did spend years trying to reduce to as few as possible first principles, but no fewer to create an understanding of how how a living system works. And, you know, I, when we first published this, I think the first attempt was in 2014. Um, and, um, and I, I said then, and I would say it today, if someone can, can, can improve them, but keep the number to eight, uh, ideally keep the number to five, but I found you couldn't reduce it to five and lose without losing too much, then we should, we should switch it. So it's not that, these principles are the quote right ones, but but I feel very passionately that there are first principles of how life works, and that if we want our economy to not only not destroy itself and and life in the process, but most importantly to be able to manifest the potential that exists in living systems, we need to align with these same patterns and principles. Yeah, um, that makes sense. That makes that makes a lot of sense. So, um, maybe talk a little bit about what you know because you were juxtaposing kind of having a a goal with a specific set of metrics as you know the SDGs have, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. Where you know there's this idea of seventeen global sustainable development goals, and each one of them is a goal, right? And mm -hmm. and um people walk around with their sdg pens um <laughs> um yeah and which i i guess is a signal of commitment to those goals um yeah. um many of those people walking around with those those pens i think are are well meaning and um and many of them are leaders of different right. um um companies uh ngos um governmental departments or even governments uh, in in certain cases, um, they're often seen running around Davos or uh, <laughs> or wherever the gatherings might be. Maybe sustainable brands. I don't know. I don't, I've not been to that particular right. corner of the corporate culture. But right. you know, what's the difference of between kind of inviting people to think from and and act from and inquire from a set of first principles to inviting a community to kind of like work towards a set of clearly defined goals and metrics. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit more about like, because I, it feels very different. It feels radically different to me. Um, and I'd love to get your take on, you know, on, on the difference between centering around principles and centering around goals in community building. Mm. Well, I would say in, in, in not just in community building, although certainly in community building, but in any business, in any um, aspect of our of our uh, of our economy, um, you know the, the 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 phrase we like to use is that by focusing on first principles, you your your objective is creating the conditions for health to emerge. And that health or life or whatever word we want to use to describe life uh, will manifest in ways we can't predict. That that by definition is the 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 genius of life. And um, uh, and so if we if we focus on removing obstacles from uh, from from having the conditions of health existing. Um, and let go of the outcome. I mean, it sounds a bit, you know, uh, woo woo, but um, but that is that is the magic of the regenerative process. So, you know, for example, if you 
you know, if you go to the doctor and, and you want to win a marathon, uh, the, you know, you could sit down with your doctor and say, yeah, here's my goal. I want to win a marathon and I'm going to train this. I'm going to set this goal and set that goal. But the, the doctor is likely to ask you, well, what's your diet? And if you say, well, I, I like to eat cheeseburgers for lunch every day for McDonald's. The most important thing you're going to do is not set a different goal about your time, but to remove the obstacle that's destroying your ability to be healthy, which is bad food. And so I think about, you know, the global economy and um, uh, and what are the obstacles to the economy moving into a healthier condition? And I start with the financial system and the energy system. Obviously, the energy system needs to be we need to remove the obstacle of to health by removing fossil fuel um, emissions. But the, the extractive financial system is also a huge impediment to uh, to a regenerative economy. And yet um, we don't we you know nowhere in the SDGs is a goal of transforming the financial system. There, there may be a desire to fund renewable energy in Nigeria. But that's very different than removing the extractive um, uh, components or, or the extractive nature of our highly speculative financial system. And, and, and more importantly and more challenging, the, the, if you think about finance as an algorithm, we've designed it to grow cap, financial capital exponentially at the expense of natural and social capital. And until we change that algorithm, we've got an unhealthy system. You, you've fundamentally got a system with a parasite growing exponentially in the midst of your healthy system. And, and there aren't any SDG goals or, or COP, you know, Paris COP agreement goals that deal with that, um, uh, that reality. And the only way you see that reality is to get clear on first principles of how living systems work. And you see that um, for example, speculation and leverage are are both extractive and destabilizing. Uh, they're not in right relationship, which is one of our one of the principles we talk with. They're not working in mutual benefit. And if you have, you know, it, it's the analogy of of thinking you're going to be healthy while you're eating McDonald's cheeseburgers every day. I hope that makes some sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. It's um, it, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, as I think about this, I, I also think about the trap of, I, I guess, under under what you're saying, I think a lot about the trap of kind of automatic or mechanical or habitual thinking in which, you know, reductionist thinking is one of the biggest habits that we, exactly. that we inherit coming right. from the West, um, where it's sort of like, okay, you know, I'm just going to trust that I, you know, yeah, that I, that I can say, oh, I want to bring renewable energy uh, to this community without, you know, okay, cool. And then we're all marching towards that. And we're measuring our success in that without thinking about the deeper questions of, you know, what is the, what is the role of energy? For instance, what is the role yeah. of energy in a healthy relationship between a particular place, the humans in that place, the the ecology in that place, and the larger economy? And first, you know, having these first principles of right relationship, honoring place, um, culture, yeah. these these can reroute us in that question. And maybe we might ask questions, you know, to, to what degree do we need a bunch of energy there? Right. Uh, you know, I'm, or I'm questions like, like well, <laughs> well, how should it be financed? Is is a loan from the World Bank that has to be then serviced for the next twenty years? Does that actually help that local economy uh, develop, or does that essentially just keep sucking resources out of the local economy? And if right. if we need renewable energy, but debt financing is in conflict with first principles, then debt finance renewable energy. May, may ease the, the problem of carbon emissions, but it's going to create another problem, uh, which is the lack of that community to develop um, because it, it, what it really needs is some form of equity investment. Um, and so it's, it's more about the how, like the goal, 
it's not that goals are bad. Um, it's more that, um, you know, when we make our plans, we should hold our goals loosely and, and, uh, and be open to some, some potential emerging that is, that is beyond what we would have set as a goal in, in a, in a positive way. I mean, I, I give you another example, like the internet is to me, the most regenerative innovation in my lifetime. Now, maybe blockchain will become even more uh, thanks to the good work of folks like you, but, but the internet itself facilitates the um, uh, circulation of information, right? And circulation of information in an information age and in an information economy is highly aligned with the principle of robust circulation is, is a language I use, but just think of it as metabolism. So the, the circular economy, people think of it as energy and materials, but the circulation of information is, is at least equally important, if not more important. But what happened? We allowed the extractive degenerative business models to be slapped on companies like Facebook and Google. So we've taken a, and, and, and search is obviously a, a hugely regenerative service um, facilitated by the internet. But then we put a, an extractive advertising business model on the leading companies using the internet and we're left with a, you know, a whole bunch of outcomes that that are, um, you know, generally horrible, like the 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 loss of health of our children, um, the mental health crisis that I think is, you know, it, it, it's got many causes for sure, but certainly one of them is is the uh, the 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 business models of social media companies, and so um, if we had aligned. The business models of Facebook and Google with living systems principles, uh, we would have all the benefits of robust circulation of information without uh, without the negatives. And and yet, if we were sitting planning on how to create a healthy economy and setting goals prior to the advent of the internet, we never would have seen the possibility and the potential of what the internet could bring. So, so we, we, yes, we should set goals and we should monitor progress toward them, but we should hold them lightly and, and be more interested in creating the conditions for surprises to the upside. Because if all we're left with is managing down the dysfunction of our current economy, um, it, you know, the, the future is going to be pretty bleak. Um, you know, the, the, if, if the conclusion is we're in, we're in overshoot, the pie is too big, the pie is horribly unequally distributed. So we've got to basically take the pie and redistribute it and shrink the pie. I don't see any pathway toward a hopeful future if that's all there is. The, re the pathway to a hopeful future is by uh, identifying innovative uh, and regenerative potential that doesn't yet exist. And that becomes the source of our future prosperity while we get ourselves back within, you know, uh, ecological boundaries. Um, it's, it's again, it's not, it's, it's the, the law of entropy still counts. The law of gravity still counts, but there's all this potential that we don't yet see. And, and, and the way to manifest that, at least, uh, my, my premise is the way to manifest that is to move our businesses and the entire economy and government practices, government agencies practices into alignment with how life works. Easy to say, hard to do. Yeah, well, and that's where I think, um, I you know, I, I heard you mention um, kind of pointing out the naive assumption that markets will fix everything. Mm. Um, and I, I think repeatedly you've been mentioning the need for regulation, the need for, I guess, regenerative governance um not just regenerative business um and i guess that takes the form of governance within businesses and governance over businesses would be my assumption is there sort of a nested mm -hmm. relationship there um tell me about a little bit more about how you see the role of governments and the role of governance within businesses and companies and um how that you know how like what's the role of politics mm -hmm. i guess in mm -hmm. 
in either fueling or impeding this movement? Mm. Well, um, where, where shall I, I, I guess maybe let me just first double click on the regulation point. This is one that I've, um, I've wrestled with a lot because as, as you know, living systems are self-governing. Um, and so how does that work, you know, uh, in, in, uh, and, you know, believe me, I've spent years inside a private enterprise arguing that, you know, we can govern ourselves better than government can govern us. And that was back in the early derivatives days. And we know how that theory worked out. So, um, it's, it's clear that humans need some, um, some boundaries, some regulatory boundaries for all kinds of things from, you know, not killing each other to not polluting the atmosphere to not blowing up the world with derivatives. Um, but if I'm, if I'm serious about an economy designed in accordance with the power, the patterns and principles of living systems, which I am, one quality of living systems is that they are self-governing. And what that's led me to is the belief that, again, we've there's an uns, there's an unspoken assumption that the institutions we have for the current context are the right institutions, and we just need the right policies from the institutions and the right governance practices in these institutions. But remember, these institutions, and when I use the word institution here, I don't mean simply organizations. I mean like, for example, the institution of the private sector or the institution of philanthropy or the institution of government. And, and the current institutional design really grew out of the post-World War II, you know, recover from the ashes and let's make sure we don't do this again. And the whole Bretton Woods um, agreements and the World Bank, IMF, the G7 that turned into the G20, uh, the dominant uh US dollar as the dominant monoculture of currency for world trade, et cetera. Well, the context in, call it 1945, uh, 48, was radically different than the context today. And yet we're not having any serious conversations about what does that imply for the institutional design of the modern, you know, the 21st century economy. And the obvious missing institution is the institution of the commons. And I, I draw heavily on, in particular, Peter Barnes's work in this area, um, who's also taught in, in our course. But um, first of all, when I use the term commons, uh, like Peter, I'm not just talking about the natural commons that we normally think about. I'm thinking about the, the collective technological development of humanity as a commons, that, um, you know, any child born in the year 2000 is born into a world where the internet exists. And, and that, and, and obviously we're born into a world where microchips exist and cell phones exist and, and well, not in 2000, I guess, but, but you get the idea. So why is it that we, we don't, we, we let people abuse all of these commons without any governance of the commons. Uh, there's a Nobel economist who has, estimated the value of our co-inherited wealth as being uh, four times greater than all private wealth. So think about the total wealth of the global economy, the part we inherit, and you know we can get into the weeds of how he's, what he's measuring, what he's not measuring, but the point is that our co-inherited wealth, everything from the air we breathe, the, the, the fresh water in the rivers, to the value of having a global monetary system where you can send wire transfers around the world and you can trade stocks around the world. All of these things that we're all born into um, uh, are available to use for free, uh, as opposed to being governed in, in, with, a, with, a, with a, uh, a mandate to preserve their integrity over the long run. And so I, you know, I don't know how we get from where we are to this place, but the challenge of a self-governing economy is that we don't have the right institutions in place to create, you know, Peter uses the, the analogy of a monopoly game. It's like we're playing monopoly, but you only get to collect $50 when you pass go. Uh, if you change the rules and you get to collect $500 when you pass go, the game will continue. 
but but the game is going to end because it's it's got a design feature that's 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 not it's not feasible that the game continues and i think the biggest missing impediment to a self-regulating economy is a um is is a common sector that is managed independent of either corrupt or short-term oriented governments um that is has a legal mandate to preserve these commons has a has a governing board that is scientifically qualified to manage the govern the, these um these commons uh and that charges for the use of them uh and as has the ability to put quotas on them uh as opposed to just taxing them and oh by the way that works just the way a fishery works so we we have plenty of examples of this working um, now, this, if it were affected, would impose huge constraints on many, many corporations and put pressure on their profitability. And the fees generated by these commons, in my opinion, and in Peter Barnes's vision, would become the source of, uh, of uh, universal basic income uh, measured in trillions of dollars. And it would force essentially the shrinking of the parts of the of the economy that we need to shrink, and yet open up huge potential by empowering people to be able to participate in the economy in ways they don't currently. So um, that's a long winded answer to your question, but I I don't find governments as they exist today designed to deal with the big decisions that we uh, that we need. But we obviously have to work with them, and so. You know, the Biden administration's, you know, whatever it was called, you know, inflation, inflation reduction act. What was it called? I forget. But the, yeah. The one, yeah. You know, it generated reduction. it yeah. generated massive incentives to to invest in uh, the energy transformation. So that's obviously a huge step in the right direction. Um, but the long term design of a of a global economy is going to need to not be dependent on the 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 luck of the you know the stars aligning so that a, a, a an act like that can be passed and not undone the next time there's an election. Yeah, I, I you know I love this provocation around common commoning and the creating the institutional scaffolding for commons as a third. Um, institutional lens and framework for humans to be you know ordering and organizing our economy and our society and decision making and i think you know and i wonder i didn't expect a big argument from you on that one gregory yeah no i i mean i <laughs> totally totally agreed and you know it, it seems like i guess there's scale you know when talking about commons there's a there's a scale question Right. So some of these may be global commons. Some of these might be local commons. Yeah. Um, and there's also a question of, you know, in, in maybe Peter's work, Peter Barnes's work answers some of this in a practical way. And, and maybe this is the wrong question to ask, but I'm just curious, you know, what's the where's the plausible pathway i i have my own ideas about this but from your perspective what's the plausible pathway to growing these comments yeah. given that it may be threatening to incumbent power structures yeah. it, it's going to radically transform business models it it will impinge on what the government the existing governments are able to you know govern yeah. Um, what, what are the pathways to kind of grow that capacity um, that you see where there's, you know, maybe opportunity? Yeah. Well, it's it's hard. And and certainly the, um, the, the, the path of least resistance is probably to start with relatively local commons where there's a broad consensus, you know, like a fishery. Um, although I was I was walking the other day and I saw a pickup truck where the where the local uh, docks are, where there's an active fishery here still in in Stonington, Connecticut, and there was a pickup truck with a sticker on it that was was very un unflattering toward the body that governs the local fishery. So uh, it's not that any of these are going to be without uh, without 
pushback. But um, but I think I think there are, you know, virtually endless numbers of local bioregional commons that are in various degrees of trying to self-organize around a a common management uh, approach. You know, one river at a time, one fishery at a time, one forest at a time. Uh, and so the the first answer would be just to, you know, if I were a you know if I were a billionaire with a with a big philanthropic interest, which I hope I would have, I would fund lots of experiments in bioregionally based natural commons. They're the kind of obvious place to get traction first. Um, but you know, going back to your first provo provocation, if I were sitting at the board of directors of Apple. And I'm not sure what the other five biggest companies are off the top of my head, um, but certainly Apple's one of them. Um, imagine the power of an Apple CEO uh, sitting down with, you know, here's my dream, the United States and China uh, coming together to agree that we need to establish a commons for the atmosphere and, and deciding to set up a, a joint venture uh, to be, um, you know, seeded by you know, essentially China and the U.S. Uh, initiating this project. Um, and where are they going to get the pressure to do that other than from the Fortune 5 companies on the planet? Um, it may fail, but that's what I would want them to encourage. And and how that would work, I have no idea. But um, uh, But when you get to these large-scale commons, you know, if you have the the two largest participants in despoiling the commons sitting down to agree that we can't continue doing this, you, you're, you're 80% of the way there. Um, and, and wouldn't that be a better way for the U S and China to, to, uh, to, to talk with each other, as opposed to, you know, our generals meeting with each other, talking about, uh, you know, escalating military tensions, but, you know, your your listeners will say that now I've gone off into dreamland and it'll never happen. Maybe, um, but that's that's what needs to happen, and so um, we have to find a way to uh, to encourage that. And and um, you know, again, I think if I think if we had an understanding of how living systems work, the inevitability of that type of a structure would become uh, self evident to everyone who's who's thinking about it. But unfortunately, we don't. So um, we have a we have a mentality of reductionist problem solving, as you said earlier, and so we go about China trying to, in a reductionist way, solve their problem, and we're trying to solve our problem, and it's not working. Um, so, you know, I go back to education. Um, until we develop new ways of seeing what everyone's already seeing, we're probably not making real progress. Yeah, I mean, this is where, you know, it's, so um, I so I grew up in Alaska, and um, really? I, grew up, I grew up fishing, and um, I also worked at the local watershed forum, which was essentially the sort of like commons managing NGO, bringing together different stakeholders. Um, I also worked at Fishing Game. Uh, I worked at the canneries. I basically worked in uh, growing up at every single sort of facet of like the actors that made up um, the Alaskan salmon fishery, which is generally held up to be kind of one of the highest achievements yep. in fisheries yep. management. And I remember thinking, you know, as I was out there bobbing up and down in the ocean, chasing after fish, chasing after salmon all of which are going to go up a river. Um, this is insane, right? The the way that, so this is sort of like a, this is a, a little bit of a provocation, I guess, and just like a thought experiment. So mm -hmm. in that fishery, you know, in that commons, the way that it, the, the way that the scarce resource was managed was to create uh, quotas and to sell the fishing rights to a discrete number of of fisher folk who could sort of like own the ability to go fishing mm -hmm. and then to control the windows of fishing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. sort of you know allow escapement and all of these other things um 
and essentially to raise the cost of fishing, right? So that um, a much smaller group of people were able to and capable of going out and chasing those fish. And, you know, one way to think about that is they essentially forced everyone to burn a bunch of diesel um, running around in the ocean chasing after fish that were going to all go up the same river. Hmm. Right. So all the again, all the fish are going up a river. Um, Native Americans um, and, you know, the Native Alaskan communities and uh, and and fishing game and other folks, you know, are continue to be allowed to do things like put in a fish wheel or put in a net at the mouth of the river for anyway, you get where I'm going. It's like the re there's an enormously efficient way to pull mm -hmm. those fish mm -hmm. out of the water. And I always find wonder, amount of fish. Yeah. Right. Well, if you, if you apply the same types of thinking, okay, so we could allow, we could monitor and have the same type of escapement numbers up river and no one, and, and no one needs to go out and chase the fish around right. in this romantic individualist quest <laughs> to like, right. you know, um, which is just a bunch of diesel and seasickness, basically. Um, <laughs> um, but why don't we? And, you know, and I would bring these ideas up, you know, I was thinking about this when I was, you know, I was 18. I was like, why are we chasing these fish yeah. around yeah. the ocean right now? Like, I know where they're all going. Yeah. And we could all get together and have one hell of a party. Right. We could just be partying right now. Right. And just set up the, the right river. Hat. We <laughs> can right have place. a whole party for for yeah. like two months with you know some fish wheels and some nets, and everybody yeah. can just be pitching in, and that resource, the, the, and we could more effectively probably right. significantly increase the efficiency of resource management. Um, you know, and and when I would bring that up, that idea, like why why are we doing this when we could clearly do that? Mm. Um, People would say, what are you, a communist? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and I'd be like, well, no, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think I'm a communist. I just think logically all these fish are coming up a yeah. single place and I'm just lazy. And like, I would prefer, <laughs> I would prefer hanging out with you all, yeah. like yeah. drinking some beers around a campfire and going and pulling the net in every once in a while than yeah. like being out here at four in the morning you know, trying to using radar right. and right. a little boat and trying to catch these fish when I know where they're all going. And, you know, I'm so I'm curious if we sort of piecemeal this image of sort of like place by place engaging in, you know, sort of commoning and resource management, um, we don't necessarily achieve the kind of transformation of an economy that I think is required, right? And I think you were sort of hinting around this. It's like, there's a mindset change. There's an evolution of how we think about things that's that's a sort of a prerequisite. But, you know, what's, yeah, it's a little bit of a provocation. You know, I, I guess I'm, I'm skeptical that if we had a million examples like the fishery I grew up in Alaska all over the mm -hmm. world, that we would actually be making the, the, the systems level change that we need to mm. transform how society is relating to resource management. Yeah. So I'm curious, does that resonate with you? Does this sort of circle back to, you know, what you're thinking about change of paradigm or, you know, what do you do with that? So I, I would first say this isn't meant to suggest there's a silver bullet out there that all we need to do is this. And then we have a regenerative economy. Um, I guess I was, throwing out this notion of the institution of the commons as a massive project for the next, you know, for humanity for the next, I don't know, 25, 50, 100 years to get to work on. Yeah. Um, the, the example that you used is, is very interesting in that it immediately opens up the complexity of this. Um, so the, there's, there's two th immediate things that come to mind. One is that anyone responsible for managing the fisheries in Alaska needs to also be aware of and connected to those who are managing the forests. 
because you would know better than I that unhealthy forests leads to unhealthy uh, uh, fish going up the stream because the forests don't fall and and create the eddies that the fish want to have their babies in or something like that. Um, and if the bears aren't there to um, to take the fish out of the water and compost them in the forest, then you don't have healthy forests. So the logging industry immediately becomes part of the equation. And so the commons responsible for the forests and the commons responsible for the fishery at the very least have to understand how these two ecosystems interact. And then you have the interests of the fishermen and, you know, your, your beautiful picture of drinking beers by the river probably employs less labor than, you know, the current situation. So this is an enormously, enormously complex challenge. Um, but the other cool thing about Alaska, just to prompt our, our thinking is that they're also with the, uh, you know, one of the leading examples of a um, of a natural resource commons, where yeah, basically a, UBI, yeah. I mean, yeah, no, where there's a, you know, yeah. you yep. actually get paid by the oil extraction to go sit by the river and wait for the fish to come in. Yep. So, again, none of these things on their own solve problems, but it looked at holistically, there there may be a, uh, a potential that we don't yet see. I guess, you know, as we're talking about it, what, what I think is, you know, it's like, what is the narrative that invites people to envision that, that world, which is like, oh, yeah, maybe we have labor, you know, maybe there's less of us working, but maybe we can distribute the shares of a more efficient resource management in a way that's really awesome. Right. It doesn't impinge on, in, in fact, increases individual creative creativity and agency and right. conviviality right. um you know what if this is a way of managing this um versus this and just kind of like inviting people be, and i don't i think that's one thing that we need you know i would just sort of call out i don't think i do enough at, of this and we sort of like the the we of those of us who are engaged at, and maybe self-identify as regens or regenerates or regenerati or the regenerative <laughs> movement or you know whatever we're identifying ourselves as people who think wow we could have right relationship with the greater than human world and we could you know and we can be living in service to actually uh, biodiversity and life and each other and wouldn't that be joyful and amazing and exciting? How do we paint the pictures of that? How do we tell the mm -hmm. stories? How do we invite people to see in compelling, you know, science fiction or yeah. or movies or paintings or poetry or songs? The the, the opportunity. It's like that that adjacent possible future. Yeah, there is nothing technologically um, crazy about. Right. For instance, allowing all the fish to come up the river and capturing right. a certain amount right at the mouth, right. distributing the resources, like every bit of technology or, and, you know, it's a completely solvable um, resource challenge. A hundred percent. There's zero that needs to be innovated except for on the narrative, cultural, societal yeah. side of things, right? That's yeah. where the innovation is, um, you yeah. know? I'm curious, are you doing any uh, futurist sci-fi work uh, at the moment? Um, yeah, I, I am. Uh, not so much sci-fi, um, but, le but let me also, I mean, just just give you a, but before I, well, let, I'll, I'll answer your question first. So one of the early projects we did at Capital Institute was storytelling. And, and if people go to our website, um, they'll find uh, something called our field guide to investing in a regenerative economy. And my colleague, Susan Artarian Chang, over many years um, documented, I think over 50 stories that um, were for us, the emergence of the regenerative economy, even though people didn't look at them and call them regenerative economy, they called them things like, you know, farmer's markets or funky co-op banks or, you know, Mondragon or, uh you know uh, holistic grass man holistic management on the world's grasslands 
Um, but these are all, there's no, I have no doubt in my mind. In fact, some people would say to us when we explained to them what the regenerative paradigm was, they literally would say, oh, that's what I'm doing, even though they never heard of it. And that to me is actually very promising because it suggests that we are intuiting our way toward the future we need um, in response to the chaos and, and that's around us. So the the emergence of farmers markets, which is kind of the in the in the one sense most trite and trivial, and in another sense most profound um, example that I can think of, is is to me, you know, the the industrial ag system got so bad. And it affected human health so directly that farmers markets and everything they they represent emerged out of that chaos. And so, um, so yes, I think story. I mean, ultimately, I think this is a storytelling challenge more than anything because, you know, we can all develop theories and ac academic ideas and principles and whatnot, but until there's a a felt connection with this, um, uh, it's not going to. It's not going to take off on the uh, at the scale that it needs to. And for me personally, um, what's attracted me is really the um, this idea that we're we're part of of a of a of an evolutionary process that's not just been going on on this planet for four billion years, but it's been going on in this universe for eighteen billion years. That is the regenerative process, and um, you know this will maybe spark and and um uh and inspire some people and and not others um but for me the connection to this this story you know that you're i'm sure you're familiar with um, mary evelyn tucker and brian swim's journey of the universe story but but the you know thomas berry and 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 brian swim and mary evelyn have been developing this universe story for decades and I find it just like, you know, goosebumps inspiring to think that we're part of this process that is just so vast. And and I was reading one of Brian's books recently, and he he says he's a, he's a like serious cosmologist for those who aren't familiar with his work. And he said that if you took away all of the <clears throat> particles and parts and things in the universe, stars, planets, asteroids, if, if you took it all away, there'd be nothing left but potential. And that like, if that doesn't tell us that that aligning with how life works and tapping into unseen potential is not the source of our prosperity, I don't know what does. Um, I, that That is the, the, it's the science fiction idea that's not science fiction, it's actually reality. Uh, it's latest, it's the latest science, which by the way, happens to be aligned with our indigenous wisdom traditions so yeah uh, totally I, I mean that's that's me you know someone else is going to want to have a super animated you know uh techno version of reality to get them inspired i, I don't I, if i knew no, how to I do mean, this, I don't, I'd know. Be doing I, don't it. Know. I don't know i think it's a great provocation and and some of the most transformative you know a couple times i've gotten together and um just told the story of the universe as a group right where you get a group of people together in yeah. a circle and you just start and allow people to just like and you you know what i find is that you end up jumping back and forth a little bit because people are like oh yeah. yeah and like in order for that to happen this you right. know this this happened and and telling it all the way forward and you know i just get this image you know again just like to invite people to see an image of like a living image of how this might work and the transformation that might be possible and might be threatening to different yeah. people. Yeah. You know, what if I just have this image of being in the beach in Kenai, Alaska and the communities there at the beach and we're fishing and we're telling the story of the universe becoming mm -hmm. all the way to that moment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's a great, it's a, it's a hell of a good time. People are yeah. having a great time. There's kids playing yeah. You know, it's human scale. All of those fish are coming to us, right? right. And we right. spread out to, to the rest of the world. And, you know, um, yes, in order for something like that to happen, we need an enormous amount of complexity and subtlety and capability uh, for our economic and social and cultural systems. But in so many cases, the 
technology needed to have right relationship with the abundance of life is actually very simple. Hmm. It, that's like, where you come in. Right, right. The, exactly. The, I mean, yeah. that's what compels me around yeah. social computing, right? Yeah. The idea yeah. of generating uh, digital commons to be managing that complex set yeah. of economic and social relationships so that we can, so that a group of people can come together and say, hey, actually, this is, this is a way of rooting in place a cultural, re regenerating a cultural relationship with this, this abundance that's coming mm. from our soil or from our rivers or from our forests. And let's codify that into our economic relationships and to the way we distribute resources. That's, that is certainly what has inspired me to be on this path with Regen Network. Yeah. It's like, and and isn't like it interesting that blockchain technology arrived just when we need it? Yeah. And, and maybe AI is arriving just when we need it, if we use that tool. Um, there's actually a guy in our, in our course who's working on an AI engine to drive. I mean, I have to I have to connect him with you because he he's he's he probably is 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 fully aware of, of what you're doing. But um, he's got some I, I don't understand it yet, but it, he's got some ideas on how to essentially create a a living systems principled coded ai yeah. that that um that would help with this and I, I, yeah i think I, I sort of feel like i had a conversation with somebody recently who was doing that and and no absolutely i mean i think we can kind of create these kind of constitutional ais so to speak that are rooted in our living cultural discourse it's a mirror i mean it's just a yeah. mirror like, like right. large language models are this beautiful mirror of what we're right. Right. saying is true and how we're saying things yeah. are true and you know i do feel like we're we're that's where the silver lining is that's where the hope and inspiration is is i i, I think we are we have all of the tools it's like we're sitting there and, and everything we need is surrounding us mm -hmm. in order to take those steps the challenge is in our way of seeing and our way of thinking and exactly. you know, as you've said several times and how we shift that and how we respond to this ongoing set of disruptions do yeah. does that cause us to respond by moving up a level or do we fall down a level right. in how we're thinking yeah. Or both, because you know it's not going to happen in the next five years. It's a and it's going to be heterogeneous people. It's, it's going to be both and. It's going to yeah. be a mess. And yeah. exactly, it's yeah. a you know this is a four hundred year plus project. So yeah, and you and we don't have four hundred years. We're already late. But just just think about the educational project alone, which is the one I've focused on. You know the 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 unlearning and relearning, and then you know meanwhile we're still minting Harvard MBAs every year with all of the wrong learning uh, or a lot of the wrong learning. I, I shouldn't say all the wrong learning, but we're reinforcing the habits we have at a much faster rate than we're unlearning and relearning what we need to see. And so the, I mean, the, the, the educate, call it education, whatever you want to call it, that project alone is a, is a multi-decade, multi-trillion dollar project. Yeah. Um, which, by the way, has virtually zero ecological footprint. Yeah. Thanks to this funky looking thing that you and I are staring into called Zoom. Yeah. Um, and it's not that we can learn all this in courses. It has to be done experientially. But um, there's just so many things that are not in the, on the horizon of our goals that are going to create opportunities for prosperity that um, that honestly, I, I I don't allow myself to get depressed about it, even though. I've I've studied all the facts pretty carefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, definitely. Well, we're. Um, I'm just looking at the time, and um, my next engagement is actually uh, getting to work with the uh, with the community that is governing Region Networks um, economic parameters. And so, oh I'm gonna, wow, <laughs> I'm going to hop over to our kind of uh, Commons Economic Council that's thinking about you know how do we oh. how do we program you know the the economic flows in our in our system and um so i'm I'm actually enormously excited at some point we, we'd love to have you uh yeah i'd love to learn, learn about it's what you're coming up with that that sounds fascinating super geeky and, and lots of fun but this has yeah. uh, just been an enormous pleasure and um just honored to have have you on the show and continue to be in dialogue as we work on this big beautiful project together well gregory thanks for having me and it's always always great and and i learned a lot just from your provocations they'll have me thinking 
thinking further as as we go. But uh, it's great to be on the on the journey with you. And you, you know, you you found this space before I did, so I I have a great debt of gratitude to you. You could have been up fishing and having a good time, but you're doing the real work. So thanks for uh, thanks for everything you're doing. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, we're we're on this journey together, and uh, it's you know I oftentimes say it's it's not necessarily when we start this journey. It's you know the the depth of our feeling as we yeah. you know yeah. and and the ability you know I I really honor you in setting this example for how people can um, make realizations and change their lives. You know, it's like the, the journey, I think this this archetypal journey from Wall Street to being a pillar of the regenerative movement is incredibly inspiring. So I'm, you know, I really- It's regenerative. Honor, yeah, no, I really <laughs> honor, I really yeah. honor that. And, and I encourage, you know, it's like, it's gonna take, it's gonna, there's gonna be people ideally who are born in this in in eco villages or you know yeah. places and they've just lived it and breathed it it's going to take people who are leaving you know big big companies or leaving industries or leaving government um it's going to be people who stay there who stay inside right. the institutions do the hard work inside and do the yeah. real hard work of of continuing yeah. to maintain those relationships and bring these ideas in yeah. uh, it's going to it's going to take all of us so Absolutely. Uh, yeah all right Absolutely. Thank we'll you so see much. you on the path. All right. Cheers. Be well. Thanks, man.